to a protocol which is easier to follow. So this is about my views and experiences. Uh, and I have a kind of a statistics that I made in my practice since the time I have taken this Navidate in 2017. Out of the total 72 cases that I did of all on four fast and fixed upper and low 66 implants or 88 implants, the ones which I have done without the help of a navigation or without the help of this Navidate is almost 45. And this I did some with static guides and some freehand. Then since the time I got this Navidate, 2017, and uh, from 2018, uh, December onwards, I started doing a lot of all on four and fast and fixed cases with real time dynamic navigation. So my experience today is about the cases that I've done. I've selected two cases, two different variety of cases. One case which has teeth present, which we extracted, Implants already present, two implants in that patient, we extracted, we went ahead, did uh, with dynamic navigation, taking teeth which were used to trace and placing implants in that situation. And another is a complete extraction and followed by immediate all on four case. Alright? So I'm going to talk about uh, bedrosin classification. I'm going to basically speak only on the region 1, 2, and 3, and the rest of the speakers will talk on the complete entropic cases. So what I realize is, is cases where total extraction is the only way out, we have a lot of options. You can do eight implants in the upper jaw, you can do eight implants in the lower jaw, you have uh, six implants that is possible. A uh, lot of companies have come out with uh, six implants in the upper and the lower jaw which you can then uh, go ahead and do uh, full mouth rehab. I somehow like uh, all in four, especially when I don't have to uh, go into the sinuses or into pterygoid areas. And this most often is a graftless solution. So you don't need really to uh, go ahead and do a lot of grafting in these cases. So a lot of factors play a role and uh, in our decision making in what case we take. So we follow a protocol to select a case also. Uh, it's basically the amount of post bone available, the amount of soft tissue that is available. So I, I'm going to talk about two such cases wherein I'm going to discuss the protocol that I follow. Basically I follow the rule book of what has been given in Navidin tutorials with few modifications which help me achieve better results. I did realize the major problem that I had was initially with tracing. And uh, over a period of time I realized uh, that uh, you can evaluate your tracing after every tooth is being traced and you can get a better score. So coming back to this slide, as I said there are many factors for me to choose what implants and what how many implants I need to do in that system. It, it is uh, surgical factors, prosthetic factors, what are the armor material that I have in my practice, uh, what biologics we need, the grafts, the membranes, and most importantly, the skill of the treating doctor. So the decision tree that happens in my practice, uh, the protocols we follow is, first is the case selection. And in that, after a thorough case history that has been taken, we, in the first visit, do a thorough clinical examination we go ahead and get the patient's photos and then uh, we used to earlier take impressions, alginate based impressions and core models and then evaluate after the patient is gone but these days we have intraoral scanners so that makes it much more easier and then definitely we go ahead and get a cone beam computed tomography and once all this data is ready we send the patient back, we sit down and then me and my team, that includes a prosthodontist, we discuss the treatment option that we have for the patient. And the next visit, the patient comes in, we discuss the finances, we discuss the treatment plan and what are the options the patient has. And lastly, that's when we decide how to go about it. As far as uh, the protocol that I follow for immediate extraction and implant placement is, as we all know, once the DICOM data is ready, we load it. Uh, once we have the data, we check 
whether there's sufficient landmarks for tracing available or not. Most fortunately, uh, most often, I've been very fortunate that uh, the teeth that are indicated for extraction are the areas where I need to do implants. But there are certain teeth which I did not extract immediately and I use them as my traces. As I, I trace them and keep them as a reference point. And once my implants are done, I take this teeth out and since I already have an intraoral scan of the patient, the lab is communicated, the case is then uh, sent uh, after the abutments has been selected, we send it to the lab and that's how the process goes ahead, which we'll discuss later in the lab communication. So once we select the landmarks for tracing, we go ahead and start. So this is what I have realized in my practice is certain tricks is uh, one, definitely we cannot deviate from the standard protocols. We need to follow that. That's uh, take teeth in the different zones, okay? Especially form like a triangular triad so that you have more area to cover for tracing. Second, always use fixed and firm teeth as far as possible. Now in my cases, whenever I had teeth which were mobile and indicated for extraction, but I was not planning an implant there, I splinted those teeth so that I could trace it. And I splinted it before we go ahead, went ahead and got a CBCT done. So that's how the error is minimized. So all those people who think, okay, this is a full mouth case where you're extracting teeth, and, but you're only placing four implants, how do we take the tracing fixed reference points? So my, uh, my solution here is that those teeth, you, you split it either with the orthodontic ligature wire or in periodontal uh, specialty you have a fiber splint. So you use a fiber splint, splint those teeth, trace them, once your implants are done, you get them out. So selection of the landmarks is the key critical step. And what I do always is I believe in getting the score of one once I select my teeth and tracing and I make sure that nowadays, since the time I have internal scanners since last few years, uh, it's been two years, so I always prefer loading the patient's internal scan and I prefer doing a surface scan registration rather than with a DICOM case. So this is my first case. Uh, I'm going to discuss these two cases in this first part of presentation. This is Mrs. Irani. Uh, she's a 65-year-old female. She's a science teacher, no systemic history. She lost her teeth because of poor oral hygiene. Otherwise, her general systemic health is good. No diabetes, no blood pressure. These are her pre-operative photographs. If you look at her lower jaw, she has got just four teeth present. And the upper jaw, this is the implant that had been done a few years back. And these are all the teeth which are almost greatly mobile. And if you look carefully, the, there is loss of hard and soft tissue component with the upper six. The sinus is dipping here and she's not keen on going ahead and doing too many of graft procedures. So she came to me specifically with a request, Doc, I want minimal implant to be done and rehabilitate with that. We went ahead, this is the occlusion view. I guess this is the site where the implant has been placed. We did the CBCT planning of this case. So earlier, wherever she got the implant done, I guess the root has been submerged because they didn't want any bone loss to happen there. And these are the teeth, the upper six, which has a fracture. This was only one sound tooth that she had. The whole of this bridge was mobile. These teeth were almost grade two to grade three mobile. What we did in this situation, we went ahead, we did our planning. I said, okay, you have two implants here. Let me add four more and then I'm going to connect it. I'm going to remove that screw routine prosthesis that she has there. And I'm going to join all these four and the early two implants and give her a prosthesis. So we did the surface scan, the intron scan, and we merged with the CBCT data. So in this case, if you look at it, I have utilized one molar which was firm. This was an implant prosthesis which was firm. And then I splinted these two teeth which were mobile in my earlier CBCT that was checked in the earlier photograph that I showed it to you. So this is how I went ahead, merged the scan. And then in this case, since she is a teacher and she runs an academy at her place, she said, Doc, try and give me teeth 
at the earliest. So I said, okay, I would need around 24 to 48 hours for you, for me to give tea to you. Uh, so we did an abutment selection in this case. We planned the abutment well in advance, and then that's how we shared this with our uh, laboratory. So this is how I said getting a score of one. Uh, I keep it as mandate in my practice, and that's where the accuracy comes to the best possible way. Okay. Went ahead, and then we calibrated the tracer tip. Did the registration part. We extracted those teeth. They were quite mobile, and you see that we grossly displayed with a lot of bone loss around. It. So once the calibration of the drill was done, most often for maxillary arch, uh, I calibrate my denser bone uh, system. I use this also the calibration burst uh, so that I can identify the bone as well as uh, make sure that uh, we are able to get good primary stability with those implants in the maxillary arch. Okay. Went ahead. That's how the implants were placed. At 1, 6, 1, 4, 1, 1. But then look what happened. I initially selected a tooth here for an input. But while extraction, this root piece fractured. And while in the root piece, I realized that some amount of buckle plate of bone is quite thin. So this is the biggest advantage we have compared to our static guides. So while the surgery was going on, I shifted my implant position from 2-2 two, two, to 2-1. Two, That's from the lateral incisor on the left upper quadrant to the central incisor on the upper left quadrant. This is only, is only possible with dynamic navigation and which cannot be achieved with your static guides. I have done close to more than 75 static guides right from single tooth to full mount and this is one big advantage I feel we have with our navigation system. So then we change, we went ahead, we did with the now, this was originally the site that we planned, but then when we had a deficit bone here, I went ahead and did an implant in the region of 2-1. So, with the help of osteodensification burst and with the help of navigation, getting my implant in the post-secure bone helped me achieve good primary stability, and that's how I decide for an immediate implant in such situations. So you see here, where there's deficit on the buccal plate of bone, where the lateral incisor root was fractured, I went ahead and did little grafting there, sutured. These are the pre and post, or these are the post-op radiograph that we have of that situation. Very interesting case, Mrs. Gridiali, I have made a video also of this case, so that it was as a self-explanatory. So let's play this. implant planning we did. This is how we are calibrating the tracer tip. So this is all on four again. See very interesting part is here I have taken just three teeth but they all were firm and the issue came when I wanted to place this implant in this angle that's when this tooth was obstructing it. So again what little I did was since this tooth was my fixed reference point for tracing I chopped the tooth into half so that my drilling gets in easier. And after my implant was done, I extracted the tooth. So see here, so this, especially this angulation, this molar was obstructing my drilling sequence. So that's how I went ahead. We did four implants. One at an angulation on both the posterior segments and in the anterior, we did two straight implants. All in four, we went ahead, could get good accuracy in this situation this implanted site 2-2 two, two. the, the upper left lateral incisor and this is the 
site to find. Now, the another big advantage that I feel with dynamic navigation is I'm able to be very clear and away from the sinus, that roll of the sinus, and absolutely not perfect. So this is the post of RBG. We went ahead and gave a prosthesis the same time. The same case discussed through this. So this is how I did the planning for both upper and lower. And as I said, why I'm showing this case in particular is first I took only three reference points. One, two, and three for tracing. Now these were indicated for extraction, but I said let me first extract these two, place the implant, let me keep this, this, and then we went ahead and started doing implants. So when I was trying to place an implant here, when I was trying to drill through here, this tooth was obstructing my view. So what I did, instead of extracting this tooth, I just chopped a bit of it which was coming in my way of implant placement. So once we did that, we extracted this tooth I kept in place because it was her lower RPD which was maintaining the vertical height. So till the time I didn't give her a prosthesis which came from the lab after 24 to 48 hours, I kept that one last molar just to maintain the vertical height and also I realized that when we do uh, these all on fours and when the patient tends to bite, the healing abutments tend to hit each other with a lower arch and that causes sometimes trauma. So that's why I kept that with her uh, temporary partial denture so that she could come back and later on we could go ahead and do the prosthesis. Luca, I am done with my two cases. Good.